Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Given Melbourne has been in some form of lockdown for over 200 days and Victoria has been under a state of emergency for over six months, it is not surprising that the state has seen the emergency of the strongest and loudest anti-lockdown and virus truth movement, one of the first and most prominent voices of this uh, movement. Uh, I should have, how do you pronounce your surname again, Fanos? It's Fanos Panayides. Panayides, Fanos Panayides. I should have, that was the one thing I forgot to ask you before the, before the show, Fanos Panayides, who founded the, the 99% Unite Facebook group and movement. Fanos first appeared on Wilms Front back on May the 14th after he was dragged off stage uh, during the Mother's Day anti-lockdown protest, which was in the, the last few days of the first stage three lockdown. He subsequently appeared at the May 31st anti-lockdown rally at the Botanical Gardens when Melbourne was at stage three two restrictions, which was met with a heavy intimidatory uh, police presence. Fanos was one of those raided, arrested and charged with incitement over the September 5 Freedom Day uh, protest at the Shrine of Remembrance, along with uh, uh, Solian uh, Millen, Anthony Kalouf, Zoe Bueller and James Bartolo. Since that time, uh, since his uh, uh, arrest, Fanos has moved his activism to political lob lobbying and educating his followers on how legislation works and how it, it is used against the public and exploring ways how citizens can use the law to hold governments to account. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there, well, there was another lawsuit that was uh, launched again today. I think that uh, that brings it to about four serious lawsuits uh, now. Uh, so Fanos uh, returns as my guest uh, tonight to reflect on his activist journey, the setbacks and perseverance and where he sees Victoria heading beyond 2020. Fanos, how are you doing? Tim, good to see you again, mate. Thanks for having me on again. And it's, uh, I should say it's a, a warmish day uh, in Melbourne. I like, always dress up for my show. You've just got the, the, the singlet on tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a lot more uh, leisurely uh, type clothing, mate. Um, you know, a little bit more sporty. Yeah, the uh, weather's been quite forgiving today, so I thought I'd take advantage, most definitely. Uh, I call it uh, virus frying uh, weather because, well, viruses, yeah. they don't survive well in the heat, even though we're still only allowed uh, to enjoy the the sun for for two hours a day and uh, only allowed out within a five kilometer radius of our uh place of residence which uh you're up in uh epping i'm not sure how far that uh, uh gets you i'm down the the frankston peninsula way it doesn't get you very far <laughs> the five kilometer radius five kilometer radius doesn't get me anywhere near the beach man that's for sure no uh, you, you're not uh privilege to li live near a beach because well you can only lawfully be at the beach uh, if it's within your five kilometer radius at as that uh, mother at Al altona beach uh, found out uh, uh, a, a couple of was it was a week and a half ago now yeah so that was quite interesting um the mother at altona beach yeah um apparently she was trying to take her kids swimming and she didn't have a mask on i'm thinking how ridiculous would you have to be as an officer to believe that it is imperative towards people's health that you ensure the lady wears a mask with the kids? What's going to happen the moment the mask gets worn on it, you absolute morons? What's going to happen? The mask is going to be absolutely useless. You're surrounded by salt water, which is known to kill everything anyway. So what the hell are people so afraid of? This whole virus situation has gone absolutely beyond the joke. It's beyond, it's, got, it's gone beyond the realm of rational thinking, far beyond the realm of rational thinking. It's almost moved into a comedic state where you think you're actually watching a feature film more than actually living in real life, considering the ridiculousness of some of the news reports that come out, like, you know, um, you know, studies show that speaking English increases your risk of catching coronavirus. Studies show that standing up, all of these other ridiculous and people are believing it. So by seeing what happened that day with that woman at the beach, I don't, 
I honestly don't give a crap what that woman was doing, right? I don't care what your justification is. You are six police officers. The fact that you need to treat her like that in order to arrest her, you're either weak as piss or you don't know how to do your job. Either way, you need to have your bad, bad piss off because you don't know what you're doing when it comes to use force and when it comes to handling people. Because I could tell you right now, in the four and, a, four and a half years I was training security, I would teach restraints, I would teach holds, I would teach how to take control of people. And one of the main things we, we spoke about was positional asphyxiation and ensuring that you're not putting pressure on the abdomen. These cops have no idea what they're doing and they're an absolute joke, a joke, the way that woman was treated. I don't give a shit what she was doing. I don't care. And that was the same weekend when uh, there were a lot of people congregating at uh, St Kilda Beach, and there was a mass outrage on that uh, on the on the Friday night because uh, Paul Dowsley from Channel Seven did a live cross where there were a lot of people uh, uh, running around uh, cheering without masks on, and well, people were tweeting, "Oh, that that that's going to a." increase incre increase the, the the daily cases well we're nearly two weeks in uh there there hasn't been a st kilda beach cluster yeah so if you're ever going to look at the fact that they could say that you know our actions could cause cases to rise i'd like to draw people's attention to the police force that has been the front line in the beginning of this they believe they're above law they weren't even wearing their masks properly up until they were, they were pulled up on it, right? They still don't social distance. They never bloody did, right? Happy to, to touch people and get all over them, right? If anyone was going to have a massive outbreak by now, it should have been police. If anyone well, was going to have died of this thing by now, if anyone was going to have died of this thing by now, it should have been the police. Massive outbreak. I mean, like 30, 40 police officers all at the same time have caught it and all over the news, right? Not a station where one guy's caught it or two, right? We're talking a proper outbreak. This thing's meant to be super contagious, right? Well, that where's, that the, where's the cop that died of this? Not one police officer died of this the whole time? How many police officers are there in Australia? This thing's meant to be really deadly, right? Extremely deadly. Dangerous enough that you can shut down businesses that have been running for three generations of people. Don't tell me something is that dangerous and something that deadly, but people who are in the in the front line most likely to have suffered an illness and died from it haven't. Well, there were two outbreaks at uh, police stations, the Frankston Police Station and the Dandenong uh, Police Station. And let's uh, flash back a couple of months ago when uh, the, the Dand Dandenong, oh, there was about, I can't, it, it, there was at least about, I think, 20 or 30 at the, the Dandenong Police Station. And you remember they Did were out. I? No, uh, but they, they got the virus. I see you. I don't give a shit, excuse my language, I don't give a shit how many cases there are. I care how many people die. Because if you're going to use that same rationale and doctrine, how many people get the common cold every year? Well, it was 900 right. in Australia last year. How many people get the common cold every year in Australia, right? They're not dying from it, are they? Are they dying from it? If they're not dying from it, if they're not ending up as hospitalisation from it, I don't care how many cases there are. Cases mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. Show me who died from it. Well, the, the deaths in Victoria that are attributed to coronavirus, I mentioned the... 80, 90-year-old people, yep. Yeah, eight, eight, so 816 in, in, in Victoria died. We emphasise with... COVID, and that came out of Brett, uh, Brett Sutton, our chief health officer's own mouth. That yeah, if they if if they had a whole bunch of underlying health conditions, uh, but they had coronavirus in their system, then yeah, we record them uh, as a COVID death. So don't take it, my word or your word for it. No, no, I'm not, I'm not. No, no, I, I'm not. I tell you not. I'm just venting my frustration because I. I'm sick of I'm sick of the you know the mentality behind people and the way their intelligence takes in this information and processes it. 
To say that someone with all these comorbidities who was going to anyway die of COVID, that's like having a, a coup ready to go off a waterfall and absolutely go into oblivion and say that because the, because the canoe had a hole in the, in the hull, in the, in the bottom of the canoe, the canoe was destroyed because of the hole in the boat, not the pending due of the waterfall, which is exactly how ridiculous what these people are saying is. Tell me the people that died who didn't, who weren't actually on their deathbed. Tell me those people. Don't tell me 70 and 80 and 1 year old people that were going to die anyway. Don't tell me about people that are dying at eight when the average life expectancy of a person in, the, a person in Australia is 82 years old. So if they're 70, 80, and 90 years old, don't use them as your statistics because you're lying to the people. You're garnishing your results to serve your agenda. And a perfect example, garnishing your results to serve your agenda, did you know they only double test negative patients, but they don't double test positive patients. Why? Why would you double test only negatives, right? You want to make sure they're not a positive, true? But shouldn't you by right use the same mentality and double test positives just in case they were negative? Because why would you want to put someone who substantially could have been negative with a, with a subsidiary test and found that they didn't need to be in quarantine people who were positive? or be put around people who are positive, or be considered as a positive and they weren't. It should be both ways, but it's not. Which goes to show the agenda is about making this thing worse than it is because this was about science. This was about doctors doing their job. They would double test no matter what, whether you're positive or a negative, if you're going to, if you're going to have that mentality. But they don't. I'm not sure if you read the uh, the chief health officer's uh, daily media release, but it always says the the overall total has increased by less because cases have been reclassified, which is code for a false positive. That's yeah. what it means. And there there was uh, they're they're getting more and more attention now because there are such few yeah. cases. The one in Geelong uh, was a a false positive. There was a a couple uh, last week a false positive uh, in. Uh, Meldura and test them again, and which goes to the uh, uh, the accuracy of these uh, tests, which yeah. the invasive tests, which well they go up your up your uh, right up your nose, nearly touching your brain, and then down your throat, uh, pretty much making you gag. Some people have actually coughed up blood. Uh, having it jammed down their their throat uh, but we're told oh we can't have yet the uh the the less invasive saliva test uh, because it's not as accurate as that even though it produces false positives yeah so this is what i don't understand with the testing if i can spread corona by coughing and it going on the surface why can't you get the trace of the coronavirus within me from the inside of my mouth, and you need to go to the back of my brain to grab it. Right? Yeah, that's what and I don't get. It doesn't make sense to me. Because when I, if, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna spread the coronavirus, apparently it comes out of the air droplets, right? Out of droplets that are moisture on them, right? Apparently. Well, if that's the case, and these could easily be on my tongue, and I could easily spit them out. Why do you need to go all the way to the back of my nose to grab it? Are you telling me every single time I cough or speak, the coronavirus makes its way from the back of my head where they're getting the sample and all the way through and out, out the front of my mouth in order to be able to get out there onto the people? You see what I'm saying? Things don't make sense. Everything, everything they're doing with this whole virus since the beginning makes no common sense. And people say, oh, you're not a doctor, right? Here's my argument. Tim, when you're driving your car, if the car doesn't sound right, do you take it to a mechanic? Yes, I would because... If it doesn't sound right. Are you a mechanic? No, I'm not a mechanic. Are you but... an expert engineer? No. Yeah, are you an expert in the field automotive at all? No. Right. So why do you take the car to the mechanic? Because it doesn't sound right. For some reason, your intuition tells you there's just something wrong with the car. It doesn't sound right. But I don't need to be a medical expert or 
a, a, a professional of scientific field to know what you're telling me in the news, the media, and the government doesn't sound right. I don't need to be an expert within the medical profession to know that you told me a virus was, was said to have 4% mortality rate, said it was going to spread like wildfire, right? You've told me that this thing was going to be super deadly. Then the virus has taken its course, and within the case that you found positive, positive cases, you've had 99% recovery rate, right? A 99% recovery rate. Within the cases that you found of the numbers you had, you don't even have a 1% mortality rate. I'll bring up that CDC it. here, COVID survival rate. So we're in the 20 to 49, eight years. So we have a 99.98% chance of surviving the coronavirus, which uh, I'm sure you've got plenty of messages from people saying, I hope you get COVID and, and die. Well, there's only a, what is it? A point on, zero two. <laughs> bring it on. And if you go to the 70 plus years, 94.6% uh, su uh, uh, survival rate as well. It's it's not even a death sentence for uh, the elderly. I mean, we had uh, Donald Trump recover from the coronavirus, only had mild symptoms. In Victoria, we've had 95-year-old and 100-year-old uh, recover from the coronavirus. So it's it's... It, it, it's a, even if you are a senior, it's not a death sentence uh, if you if you get it. Mate, I've got comments here saying that people can't hear me properly on my um, on my end with my microphone. No, it's it's to do with your feed. Uh, you keep keep sort of going in and out. Oh, yeah, okay. That's, well, that's interesting. What about oh. is that better? Is that better? I talk now. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, but I can still, so I, can still, I can still understand you. Yep, great. But with the obviously the 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 the, the strategy should have been to uh, make sure that the vulnerable were uh, protected and don't lock up the healthy. But as we've seen with this second wave, they've locked up the healthy, failed to protect the uh, the vulnerable with the the aged care uh, outbreaks. And I know that uh, the uh, the aged care facilities uh, that are operated by the Greek Orthodox Church in, in your area were some of the, the first and, and worst uh, hit. And to, uh, what made me so uh, angry about the, the aged care outbreaks is that I basically uh, refer to it a, a, as a, a double whammy, is that uh, the, or triple whammy, actually. These people got infected uh, because of all the restrictions. They died alone, literally in a room with faceless strangers because they're all masked and got PPE on. And then only 10 people allowed to attend their funeral as well. Hardly a, a dignified uh, death. I'm not sure um, uh, the stories that you know about those nursing homes, but that would have been just so hard for so many uh, Greek families. The whole situation breaks my heart. You know, everything that's happening right now breaks my heart. To know that the elderly sitting in nursing homes, they can't even see their family. The one thing that keeps them alive, they can't even see them. They're probably getting tested once a week, having those things jammed up their nose. Right? They're probably left to fend for themselves. They're probably not even showering them for two or three days because of these ridiculous conditions. This is what, this is what really pisses me off about people. They are happy to, to, to spew out the fact of all the people that ha having these things happen in nursing homes. But is it just the coronavirus that's changing nursing homes or everything about what it feel, what it is like to live in one of those places? How often are they being tended to? How often are they being looked after? How often are they, are they allowed to, you know, are they able to go out and get fresh air these days? Are they made to wear masks in those places 24-7? Are they testing them once a week or twice a week, whatever else they're doing? Are they leaving them to fend for themselves if they're positive? What are they treating them like in there? Don't just give me the statistic. These people could be dying from a whole range of reasons. Some people, their only reason to hold on is because of their family. Their only reason to stay stick around 
is because of the human connection. You take that away, people don't have anything to hold on to anymore. People don't have any reason to want to live anymore. And a person, uh, 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 you know, a person's will to survive, a human being's will to survive, supersedes everything else in terms of whether they're going to live another five years. You'd be very, very surprised just how quickly people's health will deteriorate if they aren't in the right place mentally and if they aren't in the right place with themselves spiritually, if they don't feel good about where they are. You, you don't say that that's the only reason that people are killing over and dying. And let's not bring into, uh, let's not bring into the equation that you're using palliative care numbers of the Victorian government to say that people are dying from coronavirus. Are you kidding me? My mum went to palliative care. If she, God rest her soul, if she was alive today, I found out they were going to use her death in palliative care to, to put towards the COVID numbers, I would have totally lost my, I would have absolutely lost my shit. I would have absolutely lost my shit. We must remember that uh, in the, well, as the, the lead up to the, uh, the Father's Day roadmap uh, to nowhere announcement the day after the, uh, the Freedom Day protest, where we had all those additional uh, deaths recorded from people who died a month ago that they'd only recently discovered that uh, they died with COVID and they said it was a reconciliation thing. And so we had, was it, what, what, there was, I remember there was one day we had 81 new cases and 59 deaths because of a, a, a backlog. And it's like, you, th these people have died over a month ago, the funerals have already happened and they're uh, added now, and remember when Dan Andrews was also telling us, oh, you, you, you all need to get tested uh, if testing numbers aren't enough, uh, aren't high enough where we don't know how much of the, the virus is out there and we can't make a judgment to reopen. But then one day he announced, oh, we've been holding back 82,000 negative tests and you just dump it on one day. Like eh, he said these people were notified of their negative tests, but you're only telling us like weeks later It's all deceptive. Nothing's above board. Nothing is genuine in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, what they're trying to do, right? And their actions speak of trying to push a narrative more than trying to inform the people because if you're really going to be honest about all this stuff, you wouldn't be doing all of these deceptive actions to maintain your numbers, the government wants to have this thing look worse than it is. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what the argument is. The government wants to make this look worse than it is. Which begs the question, why do you want to make it look worse than it is? The CDC is turning around and says they've got a 99.7% recovery rate. The World Health Organization turned around and said that you know, the lockdown should be, should stop the lockdowns and look for different measures in terms of dealing with this virus now. Right? Why is, our, why is our government only looking at the measures that are being imposed by these organisations when it suits them to say that's why we're imposing these measures? But when the, the, you know, the, the people that are you know, giving them advice from a higher up are, are changing their perspective now, you choose not to listen. So you basically only choose to listen when it furthers your agenda. So what's the plan? Are you trying to destroy businesses? Is that your plan? Are you trying to ruin the economy? Are you trying to destroy people's lives? Are you trying to take away people's leisure? Are you doing this on purpose? Which begs the question, why are you doing this on purpose? Well, I think of a reason. If you really are moving towards a new world order, if you really are, and me, politicians and media have gotten on in this country and spoke of the New World Order in the last six months on news reports and slipping up dramatically, right? They are in the perfect recipe to have the New World, you are controlled, you are monitored, and everything is for your own safety. Everything comes under the umbrella of safety, right? So is that what we're moving into? Is that where the world is now?
and I win the test bed. Is this it? Is this what it's going to be like for the rest of the world? And they just see now how much you can push people before they push back. And you're seeing just how well you can handle your authorities to stop people from protesting. Just how well you can use media manipulation to, def to defame people who are speaking up against your bullshit. Just how deep does it go in terms of the, the, um, the swamp being polluted? Is it really that bad? I believe, yes. I believe it is that bad. I, I've written about uh, what I term the the Melbourne model, with the the, it, or the initial uh, draconian stage four lockdown was what well, you're only allowed to go only one person from your household was allowed to shop per day. There was the one hour of exercise only, the the eight, the eight pm curfew, and they would uh, the rest of the world would look largely and say that the population were uh compliant i mean and uh, victoria police well they certainly uh ma made sure to uh silence you and uh the other people who are organizing the uh the freedom day event we had uh, luke cornelius uh, uh uh chief wiggum use uh, quite hyperbolic language uh when threatening the uh uh, the police response on the day where you, your feet won't even hit the hit the ground will be ready for you when you uh, uh, w when you leave home. Uh, there was a a real uh, concerted, or you would say, intimidation effort to say. And well, Dan has his daily press conferences where he says, "Obey the rules. Uh, uh, you need to uh, comply, otherwise uh, these rules will just be." Uh, down here uh, for longer, and now while well, we have the the Melbourne model, which is being rolled out in the the UK, they have their their three tier uh, coronavirus uh, map of England. They're splitting the uh, the the country apart. Uh, that uh, uh, that certainly do, uh, sounds uh, to break up a country like that. It's uh, it's. it's, it's, it's sounds very very sinister but they're basing it on just on cases have gone up deaths have gone up we better uh lock down and going back to well the world health organization they said they they basically said oh you only need lockdowns to basically flatten the curve and get your healthcare uh system ready which is what we were sold uh back in march and we also see the melbourne model uh in new york uh being rolled back as well they're going back into their or well, trying to go back into their second lockdown, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, and Mayor Bill de Blasio. You know what I say to all that? I say back in 2017, 4,690-something people died of uh, pneumonia mixed with the flu and flu cases. I repeat that, 4,690. No lockdowns. No hysteria. No people abusing people for not wearing masks. Over 250,000 cases across Australia. Look how many people died. Nightclubs, bars, restaurants, pubs, gyms, cafes, all still open. People are still going to work. People are still congregating around each other. No one said anything. Now you've got a virus that you that, that, that was said to have have serious implications on the people. It's run its course for nine months in this country, and it hasn't even made a dent. It hasn't even made a, a minute dent in the population. You've got twenty five million six hundred thousand population in this country. Yes, it is a shame that you know eight hundred or what people have died, right? But it's only 800 people in a population of 26 million. Take into account that 70, 80, 90 year old people are dying who more than likely were going to die anyway because they had serious health implications. So take them out of the equation. How many healthy people are there, let's say? What was the serious implications of this virus? So when you look at what these people are doing around the world, in New York, in Australia, I speak to people all around the world and they all have the same question. This is not doing what we're told it's doing, yet the governments are still doing what they want to do. They still impose measures. 
They're still making sure we have a vaccine. What do you need a vaccine for? It's got 99% recovery. Why do you need a vaccine for? Vaccines take 10 years to develop sometimes. And even then, they're still dangerous. Right? Why do we need all this stuff? Which begs the question, if you look at all of these countries and what they're doing and what they're, and, you know, what they're trying to do and all of the rules they're trying to impose, it doesn't make any sense. Not none of it, none of what's happening in this world at the moment makes any sense whatsoever. Absolutely none. And measures and what all of these people in power are doing, it completely negates common sense with regard to how they should be handling this stuff. Completely. Well, the, the, the argument from Dan about why these lockdowns are needed because, oh, uh, even uh, though most people recover, uh, it uh, might uh, cripple uh, your organs uh, for, uh, for life as because a few people have had uh, ongoing health effects after they've recovered. And also that, oh, our, our health system, it'll be overwhelmed, even though at the, the peak of the... The, the second wave, we had uh, 650 in hospital and 60 in ICU. So our health, so our health system was overrun with, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure we have more than 650 hospital beds and, and 60 ICU beds. That is the peak of what we got to. But apparently we we're on the path to our health system being completely overrun. Even though it didn't get overrun, they still suspended uh, a lot of elective surgeries. In fact, uh, you couldn't go to the dentist under stage four for a checkup, only emergency uh, dental work, like if you chipped your tooth or, or something. So, so if you had a whole bunch of uh, tooth decay happening and you didn't know, uh, and you missed out on a checkup for, for how long, it could have been a whole lot worse. That's just one example of uh, other health treatments that were delayed how many people died because of the fact that they couldn't go and do um you know um important surgeries or get important checkups done right how many, people, how many people have died from medical malpractice or how many people have been put in a serious position with serious health implications because of the fact of these ridiculous measures you see we don't know this information we don't actually know what's seriously going on in the hospitals we don't. They're all bound by confidentiality. They're all bound to not speak, otherwise they'll, they'll lose their job, right? If everything was totally above board and you had nothing to worry about, why would it matter whether people speak up about what's going on in the hospitals, right? Why would everyone be bound to secrecy with everything that's going on? Why wouldn't everything be very, very easily accessible in terms of um, uh, you know, incentives that are being offered by the government for putting COVID and stuff on a death certificate? Why is all that stuff very secretive? Well, even now, there's still uh, uh, leaks emerging that uh, there's still not uh, proper uh, health uh, protocols going on at uh, hospitals and other aged care facilities. We just had that uh, Box Hill hospital outbreak, and which, uh, again, a we, we should uh, focus on the fact that the these clusters are emerging in confined indoor spaces, facilities, workplaces, not people gathering outdoors. And I thought it was interesting that Brett Sutton recently said, oh, we want to encourage outdoor activity because there's less chance the, uh, the virus is, is going to be transmitted. Is that why you locked people in uh, 23 hours a day? What? Mm. So why, not, why did you have the lockdowns in the first place then? If, if you're more likely to have this be contracted in close quarters with someone, why would you lock people in their homes? Why wouldn't you let them out? It makes no bloody sense whatsoever. You, you see what I mean? This None of this stuff that they're saying makes any sense. I know if someone's got the flu and I hang out with them at home and sit next to them for two or three hours right next to them in their home, more than likely I'd get the flu if I was living with them. But if I chose to stay nowhere near them and I was just out all day and doing my own thing, my chances of catching that thing are going to be really low. So... You know, I don't understand these these things that they're asking people to do. It's almost like they don't know what the hell they're doing. 
Seriously, it's almost like they have no... Can I swear on this show or what? Yeah, you can. They have no... Excuse my language. They have no fucking idea what they're doing. Well, as it's... I, I think occasionally they've admitted that they're just making it up as they as they go along and yeah. learning uh, stuff that well we knew was uh, basically uh, 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 common sense 101 uh, six six months ago I mean I just mentioned the 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 the, the, the fact that uh, uh, the virus is less likely to be transmitted outdoors even but uh, and this is the uh, uh, it brings us to another, uh, uh, another uh, bizarre thing: the, the, the. It's now a mask mandate. It's not a face covering ma a mandate. And uh, there was that reporter uh, from the Australian, Rachel uh, Baxendale, who's been one of the few to, to ask Dan uh, real questions. Said, "What's the point in wearing a mask in regional Victoria when you're outside in the open air and uh, you're the only person within a kilometre?" And he didn't think, "Oh, what's the the issue?" He thought that. Yeah, like you should still have to wear the mask, not get much fresh air, even if you're the only, like, how are you going to catch it? Uh, if you're the only person within a kilometre radius, you're walking on your own. I think some epidemiologist said it was something like one in six million chance of catching the virus if someone's near you outside with the uh, the, uh, the virus. I call it, he seems to have a, a mask fetish now uh, because he brought in the rule to, to tighten the muzzle now where it's got to be a, a fit and fitted masks. I don't know whether there's been any cases yet of uh, uh, Victoria police uh, 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 choking people by uh, trying to uh, tighten their mask uh, around them yet, uh, because we've seen uh, examples of Victoria police. Uh, be it's a it's a two hundred dollar infringement if someone's not uh, wearing a face covering. Yet we saw that uh, girl at the beginning. Uh, she was basically. Uh, uh, choked, and uh, we've seen some police uh, complain that, uh, well, we mentioned the Altona Beach one, that some people aren't wearing their masks uh, correctly. This whole mask thing is a joke. This whole, th this whole mask thing has been a joke from the, from the beginning. There are, s there are hundreds and hundreds of studies, random clin clin clinical trials, and, you know, um, serious investigations Investigations into whether masks actually are, you know, um, you know, bene beneficial even in an acute medical setting, and they, the tests were found non-conclusive whether masks actually have a serious benefit. If you're going to talk common sense with a mask, a, a mask is designed to protect the wearer. The, the masks that they wear in hospital, they are not exactly de designed to stop spreading illness. You know why they wear those masks when they're dealing with people, those face coverings? It's so if they're dealing with someone who's going to be spitting up at them blood or bodily fluids or whatever else, it's not going to easily find its way into an orifice. That's why they wear the glasses and that's why they put the mask on, right? Because disease, viruses can enter through your eyes as well. The mask is designed to protect the wearer. Masks aren't designed to stop spreading anything. If you're going to create a mask that was going to stop the spread of something, you would need to have a proper sealing mask, a proper mask that has a rubber seal, that has a one-way valve in it to allow you to breathe in, but when you breathe out, the valve closes off. So everything stays in the mask. Everything else you're talking about, these surgical ones, the N95, they don't create a proper seal. None of them do. Dan Andrews has no idea what he's talking about. I've worn masks since I was bloody 14 years old on the construction site. If anyone knows about masks, I wore every single different type of mask you can think of. The paper ones, the N95 with the one-way valve, the full rubber ones with the with the um, the one-way valve on the side, the ones that spray painters wear. I've worn every single mask you can think of by the ones that cover your whole face. And if you understand the function of a mask, the mask is designed to protect the wearer. What you're asking the Australian public to do has no basis in science whatsoever. It's absolutely ridiculous. And all it's, the whole mask thing is purely about what they do in a medical setting. And it's more what they do from as a tradition in, medic, in the medicine in, in, in um, the hospitals more than it has a function. So the fact whether it's a cloth mask 
or or whatever else, it's not going to do what what they say it's going to do. And it's been ridiculous from the beginning. And all of the rules being uh, forcing people to use masks and everything else, the Biosecurity Act state, the Biosecurity Act states under nine, Section 93, I believe it is, it says, um, you know, uh, what does it say? Risk minimization, uh, risk minimization strategies. And it talks about you being able to be, um, uh, may have to wear protective clothing to prevent, pre to prevent the spread of uh, something that could cause a serious risk to public health, right? But even then, you need to have a public health order under Section 60 of the Biosecurity Act to impose them. And under Section 93, it says that uh, there's a section, I believe it's Section 95. It says under Section 95 that between Sections 85 and 93 or whatever it is, it says that you cannot use force to impose any of those measures. It says an officer, an authorised officer, must not use force to impose any of the measures under Section 85 to 93 which means that you can't even use force to get them to put that mask on. You can't force them to put the mask on. And under the Human Rights Charter, under the Human Rights and Responsibility, Human Rights Charter and Responsibilities Act, it says that you shall not be subjected to medical experimentation. Now, I'm sorry, if you don't have damning evidence that says that masks are safe, then you are in breach of the Human Rights Charter and you are basically having people subjected to medical experimentation by wearing the mask without you having solid evidence that that thing is doing what you're saying it's doing. But at the same time, you're also holding yourself unaccountable for your actions because you can't be held liable if anything happens to anyone. The Biosecurity Act, that's a federal uh, piece of, of legislation. So it's not what has been restricting us here in Victoria. That has been the, the Public that's Health not, and Wellbeing Act 2008 and the Emergency Management Act. No, uh, that, that's 20, not correct. On the Section 8 of the Biosecurity Act, it states that in the state of a human biosecurity emergency, the Biosecurity Act takes precedent over every other act. It says that under Section 8 of the Biosecurity Act. It does says, it, it says does that, that say state acts, because as I said, it's a federal act. It says, it's, you can bring it up for yourself, Section 8, and we're going to have a look, because I know it and I've read it quite well. Bring it up, Section 8. All right. Now let's have a look, because it's good for people to know this. State laws mean nothing compared to that thing. Oh, here it is, here, Section 8. So if a state law is inconsistent with that, with, 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 the, with, the, with the law of the Commonwealth, right, then the state law is invalid, according to Section 109 of the Constitution. This act does not exclude or limit the operation of law of a state and territory capable of operating concurrently with the act, except as referred to subsection 2. Except as referred to in subsection 2. Part C, when there's a human biosecurity emergency and the Chief Health Officer has declared a human biosecurity emergency, are we in a human biosecurity emergency? Yes, which means under Section 8 of the Biosecurity Act, it says under that legislation that because there's a human biosecurity measure, uh, emergency, all other acts take a back seat and the Biosecurity Act takes precedent. I didn't say that. Legislation says that. Well, that, that's your interpretation of the the, of the legislation. But uh, with all of all of this, uh, even lawyers' own interpretation of the it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't mean anything until a, a court rules on it. And we've hardly seen any of that until recently, with the first the uh, Supreme Court challenge over the the curfew now there's one well it's actually they want to go to the high court uh, over the five kilometer uh, mm -hmm. radius uh, we've got a a we've got uh, jim penman of uh, uh, uh jim's uh, jim's mowing uh certainly it's yep. I, w I would recommend people to read the 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 biosecurity act to get an understanding of it uh, uh themselves but the point that i'm making to you is just because it's your interpretation of it doesn't mean that that's what no, the, the sorry courts... sorry Tim I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stop you right there it's not my interpretation of it it says except 
except under three conditions. There's not you can interpret that you can interpret the law so far, but when it says except and then it says one, two, and three, that section's basically saying state laws only run as as they can run concurrently up until except in these three circumstances. And one of those circumstances is if there is a bio security emergency. That clearly states that that, that legislation takes precedent over other legislation when it comes to one of those three things, part A, B, C of subsection two. So interpretation, yes, but there's only so much that can be interpreted when it says except in these circumstances. The point that I'm trying to, to make to you is that even though you read the legislation by that, a, it doesn't mean that a court is going to uh, decide that because there's been so many instances, not just in Australia, but also in the US as well, of them, their uh, Supreme Court, our High Court having, I mean, we have a High Court decisions which are split 4-3 here in Australia, US Supreme Court, court decisions that are split uh, five four, and uh, a lot of them are egregious decisions. So you sort of get my point that even though yeah, of course. No, that... I was just saying. I was just speaking about the fact it's your interpretation. That is interpretation only goes so far as to when you're looking at dot points in legislation that say except to these circumstances, right? Inter law the law is only interpreted so far until the point where the words and exactly what the word means has meaning. If you look up what expect means in the law, it means despite of. So except in despite of these three circumstances, those laws can act concurrently, meaning they have to run, they can run alongside it. They can't run out, out, they can't run inconsistent with it. They can run concurrently with it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's, um, look, yes, there's interpretation, but only so far when it comes to that section and the way it's worded. Uh, we've certainly seen that uh, the dismissal of uh, human yeah. rights and, and constitutional rights uh, concerns throughout, uh, well, at least Victoria's, a. Uh, I wouldn't call it a, a public uh, health response, as sort of Samantha Ratnam, the, the leader of the Victorian Greens, said it's been a police state response. And we, going back to Luke Cornelius, uh, 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 Chief Wiggum, saying, oh, people want to bring in constitutional rights to this. Well, whether you like it or not as a police officer, the Constitution is a valid document. The Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibility is a valid uh, legal document. And we saw Dan say that, oh, this is not about uh, human rights, it's about human life. Uh, well, he obviously gives no consideration to uh, quality of uh, human, yeah. human life. He even said you can waive the, the Human Rights Charter. Even though it was passed under a, a Labor government uh, in in two thousand and six, which I think that was he elected at that time. Yes, he yes he was. A, he would have voted in favour of the the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and and Responsibility. So he's dismissing the uh, the own charter that he voted in favour of as a Labor elected member of Parliament. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he very and much so did, mate. Yeah, and despite the fact that he uh, and Victoria Police at the time were supportive of the the Black Lives Matter pro pro protests, which were uh, against uh, police brutality, he's uh, defended during this second lockdown all instances of uh, police brutality, basically saying, "Oh, if people uh, just uh, cooperated, this wouldn't be necessary." Even when he was uh, the uh, the the uh, the gentleman who was having a mental health episode because he couldn't get checked into a mental health facility, he got his head stomped on uh, by a Victoria police officer. He, be, uh, even before Victoria police, it was the deputy commissioner, I, I, I think it was 
Neil Patterson or, or Rick Nugent. They both look the look, look the same. But he linked it to the the protest that had happened at the, the Queen Victoria market and said, "Oh, that wouldn't have been necessary if people didn't protest. It wasn't a anything to do." With protest, apparently, uh, any any person who uh, Victoria Police were manhandling during that uh, those weeks of protests, uh, they must have been a protester, and therefore Victoria Police could do whatever they wanted to them. And now there's an IBARC investigation into it, criminal investigation into it. But this is where we're at in those weeks of a uh, anti-lockdown protests, where. Anything Victoria Police did was uh, seen to be justified, even if it wasn't related to protesting like that mentally ill man who got his head stomped on. Yeah. The, that guy was from Epping, um, the guy who got his head stomped on. Look, I believe that, you know, looking at the way that people have been treated over the last three or four months in terms of, and people need to stop calling them anti-lockdown protests and start just calling them protests for 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 people's rights and protest for answers because what we're being told and what the the measures that are being imposed don't have any realm within common sense at all and you know the reason people wanted to go out there look mate i'll tell you right now if they lifted the restrictions for one day and allowed people to go into the city, you'd have a million people standing there in front of Parliament House with pitchforks, waiting. I guarantee it, right? Because people's lives have been destroyed by this ridiculous situation, right? Absolutely destroyed. And the police believe that they have the um, the the... They have the ability to just, you know, go and rain terror on people as much as they want. Stop using the umbrella of people's safety for the way you're treating people that are protesting. They're not protesting because they want to stand in front of you and piss you off. They're protesting because they want to be heard. They've had enough. That's why they're out there. But you're happy to, you're happy to stomp on them. Didn't you see that they were even arresting reporters at the last protest? Didn't you even see they arrested reporters and we're going to charge them with hindering? Yes, right? I've, I've seen that. And so, what's this about? This isn't see. This isn't a normal situation. This is shut anyone up who's going to speak up against us, no matter what. Everyone is expendable. This has nothing to do with. This is not a normal time in life. I don't care what anyone says. This is not a normal time in life in this country. What the cops are wearing and what they're doing and how they're doing it to people. I don't care what you say. Don't say it's for public safety when you're, when you're treating people like that. There was 10,000 people at Black Lives Matter. Where the hell were all these wankers wearing their, um, their, their gladiator uniforms like they were wearing at, at, um, at the Queen Victoria Market? Were we that dangerous as people that you needed to wear that at Victoria Market, but you had 10,000 people for the Black Lives Matter protest in Melbourne, and you weren't wearing any of that gear. In fact, you were all clapping along with them. And in Ballarat, the very same police that had the that had the audacity to, to arrest a pregnant woman for putting up a Facebook post and handcuffed the her. same people that took the knee. They, uh, they don't forget they handcuffed her as well. They can cuff her, and you're the they're the same people that took the knee at the Black Lives Matter protest. Are you guys biased or what? Are you guys only are you guys only allowing the are you police are the police in this in this state only allowing to go what goes ahead because it's backed by George Soros and his money, right? Because if it's that, you guys were happy to take the knee and do what you had to do, right? You were happy to let him go ahead. They didn't even get charged with incitement. It's also because they're scared of uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa because, well, look at uh, the continued destruction that they're bringing to, to U.S. cities. I mean, the city of Portland, which is the, the birthplace of the modern Antifa sure. movement, they're, they're burning things down almost every life, Even more e every of a reason night. why you shouldn't have let it go ahead, Tim. Even more of a reason why you should have had guys there in gladiator suits. Excuse my frustration. Sorry, keep going, mate. I just... Yeah. Where, just when you... 
when you were arrested and charged with incitement, you, uh, that was on the, the Tuesday, the day before Zoe Bueller was arrested. Were you, were you handcuffed? No, I wasn't. Okay. I wasn't uh, handcuffed. No, no, neither was uh, Anthony Kalouf. Uh, James Bartola was uh, handcuffed, uh, but that was because he didn't let them in and uh, called them fucking retards for <laughs> breaking his shit, which uh, obviously they weren't going to take to uh, 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 kindly towards. But yes, that's interesting that uh, you, neither you or Anthony were, were handcuffed, uh, but the, you, neither of you filmed it, uh, but Zoe Bueller uh, did film it and they decided to handcuff No, I didn't film it. The camera was like, no, I know. That's I, what I'm saying. You I and you know, my girlfriend at eight o'clock in the morning when they knocked on the door. Oh, that's what I'm saying, that uh, you and Anthony didn't film it, and that's maybe why the police didn't handcuff you. No, 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 they didn't handcuff me because of the fact that, mate, I'm not a criminal. No, are getting well, a technicality. Because if everything I'm saying is true and what we're fighting for, I'm fighting for their rights too. And they know that, right? And the whole thing about, you know, no, they didn't handcuff me. And a lot of people, that here's something that a lot of people don't realise. In the May protest, a lot of people were saying the way they were, they were holding me, I looked like I had my arms on their shoulders. If you've got any understanding about restraints whatsoever and you've got an S-hold on the top of someone's arm where you loop your arm under someone and loop it on top of them, it's going to appear like your arm's on top of their shoulder. But your arm's locked up because their arm is coming around your arm and looping on top of your shoulder. Now, if you have any understanding of martial arts whatsoever, you'd know I couldn't go anywhere the way I was being held. And I wasn't going to fight because of the fact that I'm not going to get more charges put on me than they, were, than they were attempting to. Right? So, no, up until this point, I haven't been, I have not been handcuffed because I don't, I don't fight when I'm going to be restrained. Handcuffs are used as, 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 as a mode of protecting people from themselves and from other people. That's the rationale behind wearing handcuffs. And if someone's not aggressive, there is no reason to put hands or handcuffs on them when you're detaining them, unless they're a danger to themselves or a danger to others. And I was neither a danger to myself or others in both of those circumstances. So no, I wasn't, I wasn't handcuffed. The, the point that I'm getting at, you've described all of that, yet they still handcuffed uh, Zoe Bueller, even though yeah. she is or she, she is in the early stages of pregnancy. She was clearly not a threat to the three officers there, yet they decided to, even knowing that, that fact, they still decided to, to handcuff her. But Luke Cornelius said, oh, we only just did it so we could secure the premises, and she was later... Uh, released like that makes it better. Yeah, it's a joke. Come on, man. What did she weigh? Fifty-five kilos. You could have easily held her with one one officer without without putting handcuffs on it. You could have easily said, "Please come with us. Please do not resist. Otherwise, we will have no choice but to put handcuffs on you." Can you please accompany us to the station? It's not hard. It's called communication. But they didn't, right? They just they went they went and put the cuffs on her. And she starts crying. It's an absolute joke, man. The whole thing, it's all double standards. Okay for Antifa, right? So it's all right for the Black Lives Matter because, because why? Because they've got Antifa and they're dangerous. Even more of a reason why you should have blocked off every road in the city when that was going to happen to stop the violence, right? Yeah. If you're prepared to do it for the Shrine uh, protest, yeah. then why weren't you prepared to do it for the, the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies. I mean, you clearly uh, sh showed that you had the capability and logistics to, well, yes. stop people at train stations and that. So obviously Black Lives Matter, the, the 10,000 people in the Melbourne CBD, they didn't just uh, pop up there. They all came there. So you could have actually prevented it at the, the, at the time if you wanted to. That's right, 100%. And you know what? The media got involved on that as well, pushing the Black Lives Matter thing. Channel 7 put up a post, which was a post that was antagonizing towards making people be even more angry when they go to the Black Lives Matter thing. Talking about all the injustices that had happened to, those, happened to you know, um, people in this country. Right? And anyway, the, the just... 
you can tell it's not you can tell that everything they're doing doesn't isn't above board you can tell none of it makes sense you can tell that it's 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 biased it's one-sided and please anyone out there understand that i have no problem i have no problem with people standing up for the rights of other people in terms of you know the black lives matter thing right i applaud it but it should be the same standard for everybody and it should be the same consideration for everybody and it should also be taken into consideration the implications towards public health when it comes to the fact that the very organizers that did this were burning down cities in the us when they ran it so for the police to say that the reason they didn't stand in the way was because of the fact that they had done that they destroyed other cities so you're telling me oh so you're only willing to use the full force of the police when you're not going to get hurt but when it's you know people that are just average joes that aren't part of a um a antifa and are going to be peaceful you're happy to show how tough you are so you're all a bunch of weak pricks is what you're saying and you're only happy you only show you're ready to stand up in your gladiator outfits when you know people aren't going to fight back very very interesting and it's also they probably feared lawsuits uh, from the the various uh, legal uh, centres uh, that are aligned with Black Lives Matter uh, and Antifa. It's taken until what is it September October for many in the 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 legal profession and and fraternity to begin representing people who've been harmed by the by the lockdown, which is what well, why we saw Dan Andrews capitulate immediately. And, and get rid of the curfew. Uh, his uh, Dan's uh, big stick approach throughout, or the entire state of emergency, has been the the insane fines, which he, he even increased more uh, with the uh, increasing the uh, the penalty for illegal uh, indoor or outdoor private gatherings to from sixteen hundred and fifty two. We still have the, the highest fine here in Victoria for coronavirus breaches before it was increased to nearly 5,000. Uh, now, apparently, the vir this is nine years, virus rule breakers rack up 26 million worth of un unpaid fines as the Premier warns, we'll, we will come after you. So, uh, you yeah, know, 19... You know what Sorry, keep going, mate. I didn't realise you Yeah, 19,000 coronavirus-related fines have been uh, dished out. Just 845 have been paid, according to about 1.45 uh, million. And it says here another 64 fines were issued in the state in the past 24 hours. So there's only 56 today. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember a time when Victoria Police were issuing 100 to 200 fines a day. The amount of fines that are being issued are quite less, and they're at places like vehicle checkpoints, which sort of gives you an indication that maybe Victoria police are sort of over this. I mean, what is, it was a, a Blue Ribbon Day on September 29th. They made it, might, maybe saw the returns uh, from their, the funds that were raised uh, this year with compared to last year, given how much uh, Victoria police had their damaged their reputation during the months of September. Look, the whole thing with the, you know what, the whole thing with the fines, <laughs> instead of people paying them, let's just create a class action against every single fine. So instead of paying, you know, $1,600 each or five grand each, let's all put into a pool and go one massive class action against the government for, for, for um, you know, giving unlawful fines to people. It'd be way cheaper, wouldn't it? Just get everyone involved. Everyone well, is out of fine. Instead of instead of everyone going to court individually, set up a class action against the government, right? That the that the fines are unlawful. Everyone puts in a hundred bucks each or whatever else. Instead of the one thousand six hundred dollars they were going to put in to pay the fine and fight them all, all at the one time. Put every single fine towards a class action and fight all of them. One uh, movement. That's what that's what uh, uh, Avi Yemeni has uh, announced uh, he's uh, trying to do with Rebel News Australia today with his uh, Fight the Fines campaign. So that'll be interesting to see hmm. where that goes because, well, the courts are clogged uh, at the, the moment. Uh, there's been, it says that Article 1500, uh, 1500 fines have been 
uh, withdrawn or overturned. Uh, we've heard some of the uh, ridiculous uh, uh, fines that have been issued, but later uh, withdrawn by uh, uh, by Victoria Police. But currently, according to legal community centres uh, such as Flemington and Kensington and Fitzroy, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, they haven't got very far with appealing through. Uh, finds Victoria. It's more the the ones that have been overturned have been by Victoria Police uh, itself. But uh, this is the the reason why I call it a police state response rather than a a public health uh, re response is because it's just been the big uh, big stick. The threats. Dan Andrews is constantly threatened in his daily press uh, uh, conferences, and uh, uh, they're uh, just breaking today that that. Uh, uh, super spreader who uh, was responsible for the, the the Kilmore outbreak. Now the Shepparton outbreak. Apparently, he didn't tell until last night that he'd been to uh, to uh, Shepparton. And I'm not commenting about this individual uh, alleged super spreader, but how uh, pe you expect people to be honest with the contact traces when you're constantly threatening, or oh, if you've done these things, we're going to whack you with $1,600, $5,000 fines. What incentive is there for people to be truthful if people they've come into contact with it was in circumstances which were against the rules? So what's your question, Tim? My question is, how can you, how, if you're constantly threatening people with fines if they they do something which is outside the rules yet uh they've come into uh, uh, they've been infecting someone with the virus how can you expect them to be under that sort of threat be honest with the contact traces that yes i'm going to confess that i broke the rule and potentially get five thousand dollar fine like you can't you can't expect people to do that because people are all about self-preservation Mm. And everyone looks out for their own best interests in terms of, you know, what's best for, for that person to a certain degree. But the, the approach that Dan has taken throughout this whole thing is that uh, we're just going to threaten you uh, all, all, all the time. And there's been numerous examples of the, the overzealousness of, of Victoria Police. It doesn't, doesn't really create an environment for... For people to be frank and forthright you know what i say to this tim if this virus was as deadly and as dangerous as they said it is you wouldn't need to be placing fines you wouldn't need to be telling people to be get, get tested you wouldn't need to be very forceful as police right people would just comply out of sheer terror of this virus people were complying in the beginning it is true, but after a certain period of time, when you allow something to take its course and then people look at, okay, what's happened up until this point? How serious was this thing? What am I being told versus what am I seeing and what am I experiencing? Then people come to the conclusion, no matter what the body of people that are, no matter what institution is giving information out to the people and no matter how credible they are believed to be the people's common sense and rationale will kick in and they just won't comply anymore so people aren't following the rules not because they want to fine because they don't believe the bullshit anymore and you could put a ten thousand dollar fine people wouldn't care anymore you could put a twenty thousand dollar fine people would not care anymore because you, you wouldn't need to do all these things as a premier if this thing was as dangerous as they're making it out to be. People would just comply, right? But it's not. It's one big farce. It's a lie. It's not what it was made out to be. There are experts all around the world who are getting up and saying just how much of a lie it is, and every time they are, they are silenced. This thing reeks of deception and lies. And the Premier can threaten all he wants because the people will get together eventually and the people will be heard eventually. Now, may not be for a year, 
may not be for a year and a half, right? As long as your reign of terror lasts in terms of your... But the next time an election comes around, the game in terms of what people will allow themselves to put the trust in, in these people, will be absolutely obliterated. There will be no trust for any politician moving forward in this state and further in Australia because of what's happened during these last nine months and the way people have been treated. And whether these scumbags want to admit it or not, Sooner or later, the time will come where you will come begging on your knees with your hands out, asking for a vote. And when everyone turns around and votes no, no confidence in their government, every single one of these scumbags aren't going to have a job. Well, it'll be interesting to see uh, the results of the, the local government elections in Victoria at the end of this month. I know the, the, the Labour aligned candidates have been doing all they can to hide the fact that uh, they are labor aligned uh, in their in in their advertising but people are, are much more given that they're, they're stuck at home uh, uh having lost their jobs they've got all the time in the world to uh become politically informed and find out who they're actually voting for and uh, this is why the the omnibus uh bill that was passed uh, late last night got a lot more scrutiny than it did when it was passed the first time six yeah. months ago thankfully the uh preventative detention powers of the the authorized officers uh was uh scrapped uh, but there still are going to be authorized uh officers and i know that uh, uh we, we've spoken about uh, the uh, the overzealousness of uh, Victoria Police during uh, this pandemic, but at the end of the day, they are the the best people to to know how to uh, enforce a, a regulations and also to defuse situations. People who don't have training in a uh, enforcement, they're the ones who are more likely to make a a, a apply things unreasonably and in a manner which is it, it escalates things tim there's going to be an absolute shit show when those authorized officers get out and start speaking to people i taught security for four and a half years i understand um tactical disengagement i understand the escalation the de-escalating de situations i understand modes of communication distance uh to yourself and your fellow guards Right, I understand. Under, I understand looking at people's body, body, body cues, seeing signs of aggression, and being able to read those things, maintaining my distance of safety. Right, these guys aren't going to have any of that. You're going to what? You're a work safe officer. You're a government employee, and now you're going to be allowed to be in, in be in a position where you believe you're going to enforce health health measures on people. These guys are going to end up getting their frigging heads kicked in because they have no idea what they're doing. And Dan Andrews just thinks by, by giving these people these powers as an authorised officer, that's not, going to stop, that's not going to stop people from being people and being pissed off and dealing with these people, especially in the situation where it's so, such a, um, where, you know, the situation at the moment is, is so on a knife edge in terms of what people people's resilience would be towards someone not communicating with them properly, that this is going to be an absolute disaster. From a tactical perspective of someone who understands how to communicate with people and disengaging and dealing with people in times of stress and getting, getting a right communication out of people, this is going to be an absolute disaster. And these guys are not going to know. They're going to hurt people. They're going to. They're not going to restrain them properly. They're going to injure them. They're going to put them in positions of position asphyxiation. If not, kills. If not, take people's lives because they have no f idea what they're doing. The police don't even don't even have a proper idea how to restrain people. And Dan Andrews thinks he's going to get government employees to act as authorized officers. Now, despite your uh, expertise and uh, experience uh, as a, a, a security officer, they, they took your security license away from you. Instructor. 
because they didn't like your YouTube videos. And this was way back in, was it late May or early June? Yeah, so early June was when I got the letter saying I was suspended. Yeah. Can you still get your license back? Because suspended. No, is because I've been company. said I'm not a fit and proper person to hold a security license. And didn't also, uh, if, uh, uh, you, you did film this, uh, the, the police did a mental health check on you because somebody complained to them that you were too passionate in one of your videos. Were well, you passionate in all of your videos? Well, someone vocalised in one of my videos that I that I spoke and there was a serious concern for my well-being. Understand one thing, when I swear and get angry, that has nothing to do with tendencies within myself wanting to self-harm. I am a very sound mind and I am definitely someone who understands the mind and how powerful the mind is and, and communication with you, within yourself and loving yourself. And if anything, I'm the person who has communicate. I'm the one who has conversations with people when they are in those in those types of situations and they are feeling to do those things with themselves. So the fact that that was happening to me, a reflection of one of my videos, I don't think so. Possibly setting a precedent that if you wanted to drag me out of my house and put me in a loony bin, definitely. That's why I chose to put that video and put it online so I can show my interaction with the police, show just how of, of how sound mind I was. So they couldn't later take me and lock me away and say, oh, well, there was a previous attempt to um, communicate with Thanos and he was quite erratic in the situation and we did we did feel for his own safety, though he told us to leave numerous times while we were pleading to help him or whatever other garbage statement they would have made up to, you know, substantiate the um, the 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 ongoing or the, the forthcoming incident, which would have been me being locked away. Right, so I did everything from a tactical perspective for my own well-being. Let's finish on by where uh, you and I see well, Victoria and Australia heading uh, beyond 2020, where we're seeing uh, with the, oh, uh, not so much the, the, the inquiry itself, but actually, or well, not even journalists, but uh, a, a former uh, staffers and qualified barrister, Peter Credlin, actually digging into uh, the, uh, the submissions into the hotel quarantine inquiry that led to the scalp of uh, Chris Eccles, head of a uh, department at a premier and cabinet. And we also saw last, uh, uh, recently uh, the resignation of uh, health minister, uh, Jenny McCarkos, but that was because Dan threw her under the uh, uh, the bus, and obviously her name uh, is uh, is Greek. Um, I'm not sure if you ever saw her uh, at any uh, Greek local Greek community events over the years. Do you think she'd ever come back to one of those, given what the the local Greek community in Melbourne has been through this pandemic? Yeah, I wouldn't have a clue, mate. Um, you know, a lot of the local Greek community of haven't been too happy with me with the way I've been speaking out because so many of them are blinded by the bullshit. So, yeah, I think she'd be welcomed with open arms at any of those events because uh, she was despite, definitely one despite of the Despite all, all the uh, deaths that have occurred in uh, Greek-run aged care facilities? Yeah, uh, you know what? I, I, I wouldn't know. Um, yeah, I think she, she has a second... I think she, her, her, her last name is Greek, but, you know... Who knows that how far her uh, Greek heritage extends? To be honest, with the way she's, um, you know, been conducting herself at the moment. Uh, the oh, the big question is: uh, Will Dan Andrews survive? Uh, make it till Christmas? Will he be forced out, or will he retire for uh, oh, family reasons? Uh, I'm sure you've heard those rumours that his his family are actually uh, in Queensland in. Uh, protection. I'm surprised he hasn't been asked about this rumor. Yeah, so apparently, he, yeah, his family is in Queensland, apparently. Um, and, you know, I find that interesting. Why are you sending your family to Queensland um, when you're setting standards that no one is to leave this Victorian state? So, once again, the rules apply to everyone but yourself, right? The rules well, apply to And the AFL. Yourself. As well, uh, Gillan McLaughlin and Eddie Maguire, they got to go up to Queensland to that uh, resort while the rest of us here under house arrest and muzzled. You know what they say? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And these people know people. 
And whether people want to admit or admit it or not, there's a circle of people that very, very few are um, privy to, right? And they say what goes in this country and in this state. And whether Dan Andrews stays or not, he's just a sacrificial lamb. I believe the guy who comes in after Dan Andrews, whether it's a man or woman, is going to be even worse. You know why? Because everything that's happening isn't happening because of the fact that we've got a premier who's an absolute nutbag. The only reason he's making those decisions is because of the fact that we, as the state of Victoria, are the test bed in this country to be under total control of its government. And everything you do is controlled and monitored by that government. You don't go into a restaurant with it without giving your name. You don't go anywhere without making a purchase they know about. You don't leave your house without them knowing, right? You don't have everything. Everything that's happening right now in the state, no matter who's leading, no matter who's running the show, it's all just part of the plan. So I don't care who comes in power after Dan Andrews. He'll be gone. The next scumbag will come in. I guarantee he's going to be even worse. Well, when uh, Victoria was semi-open briefly, you manually signed into uh, pubs and cafes, but you, it, it, given what's uh, uh, being rolled out in other semi-open uh, jurisdictions, it'll be the, the QR code where you'll have to have a, a smartphone to uh, go into, which is a much easier way uh, to... Uh, 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 to keep a log of who's been in than just manual thing because you could uh, uh, write a, a fake number, a fake name, a fake whatever. And uh, we've also, a, I'm sure you've heard them as well, the various helicopters, planes and, and drones that have been flying around, particularly uh, uh, at night and, and when curfew uh, was there. Nobody really knows what uh, they're actually four, other than they seem to be spying on us. You sort of wonder if we are semi-free again, will those sorts of uh, surveillance, aerial surveillance, will that disappear? All of the surveillance and stuff that's happening at the moment, it's just another, it's just another step in this uh, totalitarian uh, controlled society. We are moving towards everything you see in the future, in the movies in the future, where it's totally cashless. The government has control beyond belief, right? And you are just a number. And if you step out of line, you are held accountable right away. You know, there's no more freedom of speech. There's no more freedom to choose where you go and who you hang out with. Everything, and I mean everything, is going to be under a microscope and drones and dog robot dogs and all this other stuff. Why did you create all this stuff now? Why? Because of this so-called virus. So everything you're doing now is in the interest of stopping the virus. So if I use a QR code at a restaurant, is that going to stop me from getting the virus? Is it? Right. I uh, just just know. So for contact tracing purposes, that's the that's what you're. Sold. Yeah, great. So they know I've been around someone who's got it. Does that stop me from getting it? If this thing no. was so deadly, would the QR code do anything? Let's say this thing was deadly. Would a QR code actually do something if you had been in that restaurant? No. Because considering how long it would take to have your symptoms and everything else, right, is the QR code going to do anything? No. Apart from tell you not to be around other people who you were already around before you got the notification of the QR code. So let me just get this right. Someone goes in the restaurant, sits down. A week later, has signs and symptoms of the coronavirus, right, because apparently it's got a two-week period. So for one week, that person's gone around and interacted with hundreds and hundreds of other people. Right, a week later, they he tests positive. What good is that going to do to me if he tests positive a week later and I've already contracted it in the time frame he was at he was at the 
He was at the um, the establishment where I was. Wouldn't I already know about the virus because I'd have it by then? So tell me what the hell the QR code does. It does nothing. It tells the government where you are all the time. Well, that's just a, now that you mentioned that, the, the Shepparton oh, cluster, if you want to call it that, because that, that guy didn't tell the contact traces until last, last night, though he'd been there, what is it, on September 30, which is nearly two weeks ago. And the reason they found those three cases is because someone uh, came forward uh, with, with symptoms. And we're seeing today the whole, whole town of Shepparton wants to get tested but uh, and they're bracing for more cases but it's nearly been two weeks since that uh, person was there yet there's only a couple people with symptoms but it's so so basically isn't it, uh, the 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 town is nearly through the the worst it's not it's not really the beginning <laughs> that's exactly what's happening right now um you know What's going on in, in those other parts of um, Victoria in terms of these regional areas? So a super spreader. What constitutes a super spreader? Because they're, they're a lot highly contagious. Why are they a different type of human being where they sneeze more or they cough more? Like these terms, these, these super spreader terms are absolutely ridiculous, right? Um, I don't know. What was the question? What was the question, Tim? Oh, that was more of a comment, but uh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll move on to, well, we still, we still, well, we not only can't leave Metro Melbourne, we're still only allowed within a five kilometer radius of our uh, homes, only for the permitted reason. Regional Victorians, they're not allowed to leave regional Victoria. Uh, if you live in the other states and territories, uh, you're not allowed to leave Australia. Uh, obviously, there's still the state borders up so we still basically still most of the nation is an open air prison and we're told but josh frydenberg the treasurer said that international travel might not resume until uh june 2021 we are actually the most as a nation a uh, locked off uh, nation in the the world that actually prevents its citizens from leaving and there's been talk about this health passport which is code for uh, the that you'll need to have some sort of vaccination or quarantine period. We've seen the Australian government, they've locked in the deals with the Oxford uh, trial and the University of Queensland trial, which I, I, I still look the most likely candidates to get approved. We've, I heard that Johnson & Johnson were doing a trial until it was halted because someone had an adverse reaction. It looks like we like one of these vaccines will get up. We don't know how often it'll need to be administered, uh, uh, how much dosage will, will be needed. We do know that whoever manufactures it will get indemnity from any potential side effects or death. Uh, so definitely well, what you've been uh, talking about, uh, uh, it will be part of the, or you suppose, freedom deal that uh, you can have your old life back if you just uh, if you if if you just uh, open your arm. Yeah. So everything that's look everything that's part of the rationale behind all this is get the vaccine, right? No jab, no pay. No vax, no vaccination, no travel. Right, everything's about getting the vaccine. Everything's about let's do something that's going to profit the pharmaceutical companies billions. How do you how do you do that as a government when the CDC turned around and said it's got a ninety nine point six percent recovery rate? Your now you say that your rationale behind why you want people to get the vaccine is you don't want the you don't want the elderly to get sick, right? You don't want the elderly to die from it. So are you going to be sticking a vaccine in the elderly? Because the vaccine trials are apparently for people between the ages of 25 and 50. So the vaccines being trialed on people that are between the ages of 25 and 50 who've had minimal, and I mean minimal, really, really low death rate, which is, you know, not even like, you know, within the realm of dangerous. And the people that do stand to be 
affected by the virus, which are, you know, are 50 and above, you didn't test anyone with the vaccine. But when the, when the vaccine comes out, are you going to be sticking a vaccine into the 70, 80, and 90-year-olds? Who knows? We know are you going to be a lot putting a vaccine into anyone above 50? Because if you are, but or you've tested – so you've tested the population between 25 and 50, the ones who don't get sick from this, but then the reason we want to get it is to protect the elderly – but the elderly aren't going to have the vaccine. The, the elderly haven't been tested with the, with the vaccine because that wouldn't be safe to do so. So, but then you're going to put measures on people that if they don't take the vaccine, they can't travel, they can't function in society. For a virus that doesn't even have a one percent mortality rate, what the hell are we doing as a country allowing this to go ahead still? Why are we still allowing these ridiculous measures to go? I don't care what expert you are. You're full of it. Why are we still allowing this to continue in this country? Why? That's a great question. Uh, but all indications are that most of our leaders uh, all around the country still, they are not budging either because they don't want to concede that they are wrong uh, about anything or they just think that the 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 public are still scared of the virus let's talk let's talk common sense for a sec tim let's say it's a virus let's talk common sense if you take a vaccine or don't take a vaccine what is the most important part of your body you need to deal with the virus immune system thank you the understanding and the rationale behind a a a, a vaccine which these idiots, and I'm going to call them idiots because they are, all these people that support this vaccine without understanding, is having your immune system build a response to the virus, apparently. But if your immune system compromised, or you don't look after your immune system all this time, whether you take the vaccine or not, you're in trouble. So why not one health expert during this time of a government organization has spoken about getting sunlight, has spoken about ensuring you have a proper diet and you eat clean food and getting plenty of vitamins and minerals in you and looking after yourself and drinking plenty of water and looking after your mental state. Why do they just push the vaccine but not talk about the immune system and how important it is to ensure you have a strengthened immune system because if you don't have an immune system, the vaccine ain't going to do shit. Absolutely nothing. If your immune system compromised, what's the vaccine going to do? Well, they've shut the gyms down for health reasons. Even in semi-free regional Victoria, the gyms are still uh, not open. I think they were only open for about two weeks uh, before we went uh, back into uh, to lockdown. And... Uh, uh, obviously, uh, gyms are uh, an ex excellent uh, environment to do strenuous uh, exercise, and not everyone has the luxury of being able to have thousands of dollars to buy a a treadmill or a a, a bike or a free runner. Uh, they just pay the what is it, fifteen bucks a bucks a week. Yeah, look, it's looking after your health in terms of going to, the, going to the gym, lifting weights, running on the treadmill. It's fantastic for your immune system. Generally, people that get sick, have you seen most of the people that have suffered from this coronavirus? A lot of them have serious health implications. They've got mm. diabetes. They're obese, right? The people that aren't looking after their health, what, what you're telling me you go, went and ate shit for 15 years and now a virus has come along, you've absolutely destroyed your immune system and you expect your body to be able to do anything with it. Whether it's a flu or anything else, you go and hammer your body for 15 years and then you expect your body to just fight this thing off and not have any implications. I guarantee if you caught the flu and you're, and you're that type of person, you're going to be extremely sick. Right? So 
Like the fact they're stopping you from going to the gym, that's ridiculous. The fact they're stopping you from going to the gym. If you're social distancing, what harm does it have by you going to the gym? And don't say to me it's because you're touching the equipment because if that's the case, then every single supermarket across this country should be a Petri dish full of that virus because I'm telling you, those people that are stacking those shelves are definitely not handling everything with gloves when they're putting things on the shelves and when they're coming from the distribution center. So if anywhere was going to be contracting this virus at a high volume, according to touching things, it would be the supermarkets. So don't turn around and tell me that I can't train at the gym if I'm social distancing because of the fact I might handle a machine after someone else does because I'm pretty sure I might handle the can of um, uh, pumpkin soup off the shelf just after the attendant who's been putting those things on the shelf has placed it on the shelf or just after someone's picked up the can of beans, read the ingredients, and put it back. Mm. So your, your, your rationale behind why you're keeping those places closed bears no weight in terms of f from, a, from a sense of common, common sense, from an, from an area of common sense and rational thinking. Makes no sense whatsoever. But if you wanted to create a society where you don't have leisure, where you are institutionalized, where you can't have any fun, where you are just you are just a slave to the system and you're lucky to get a crumb of bread from your overlords while you wear your mask like they used to put... You know who they used to put masks on back in the medieval days, mate? They used to put them on slaves. And they used to put them on people that they didn't believe were worthy. So now by having a mask on, is that maybe a symbolic... A symbolic a show of the compliance from to the overlords and is the mask now a a visual cue of who's following the rules and who they still need to get through to right so none of this stuff with the gyms makes any sense whatsoever absolutely none uh, there's a couple of questions on uh, Entropy, the, the interactive uh, software that I use. We'll finish yep. off with two of those. They're both from the account, The Disciple of Thanos. Would you have any idea who that YouTube account is? No. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> normally these sort of a anonymous accounts, they, they can normally tra be tra uh, traced back to su some sort of person. Disciple of Thanos. What? Mm. Who would want so, to be a disciple of me? <laughs> what? All right, I'll get to, but... Yeah, I'll get to the question. So, I'm not that first great, one is: uh, a, What do you think about Donald Trump, good or bad? From um, from a perspective of face value and what I've seen, excellent. Um, from a perspective of you know, could there be more? I don't know. But from what I can see, from judging from face value, he seems like a man who, you know, is for the good of the people. My only question is why does he talk still talk about a vaccine? Does he speak about it because he just wants to go along with the mainstream while he's doing his thing? Or is he not as, um, you know, forthcoming as people might believe? My honest belief about him at the moment, judging on face value, I believe he's for the people. 100%. And, and the second question here, I'm not sure if I can make sense of that. No one has died, no cases, no symptoms, no virus. What virus are they going to spread? Chance of dying 0. 0.0000. It's not a question, is it? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite get it, but... I, it did remind me of something, the fact that we have no a, a, a coronavirus, uh, uh, the, nobody with coronavirus in Victoria is in intensive care or on a ventilator. That hasn't been the case for the last few days, yet we had five people die from the virus in the past 24 hours. So they weren't in, in ICU or on a ventilator or in hospital, yet 
they all died from the coronavirus in the past 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just begs the question, you know, just how um, forthcoming with the information is the media being and the government being. So they weren't in ICU, but they died. Yes, that's, so that's, that's, so that's they died that's, at home. Yeah, that that left me scratching my head. They died at home. <laughs> what were they hospitalized? Oh, we we don't know. It ju it just says it, all that Dan announces is the uh, the a the age range, gender, whether they were in a aged care facility, and that's all we know. <laughs> Well, um, what do I say to that? I say that even more, um, you know, sorry, I'm having trouble thinking because I'm, I'm, I'm low on carbs. So <laughs> even more oh. of um, an indication of, you know, they're not being completely forthcoming with everything that's going on. Listen, if everything was completely genuine and above board, there wouldn't be so much bullshit going on in terms of what's happening and, and in terms of explanations of things like, Palliative care, people going towards the death numbers, um, you know, inconsistencies with testing, and then you bring these numbers up, you know, a month later. You know, if this thing was honestly what they said it was and what they're dealing with, you wouldn't have so many inconsistencies, so many lies, so many people being resigning, uh, so many questions being refused to be answered by premiers, right? You wouldn't have that. If it, was, if it was honest and genuine, you wouldn't have those concerns and you wouldn't have these constant indications of bullshit and lies that are happening on a daily basis with this thing. You just wouldn't. Well, uh, who knows what uh, Dan's going to announce on Sunday. I've joked that maybe it'll depend on what side of the bed uh, he, he he gets up. But, uh, well, this is the reality of uh, Victoria at the moment. We... Uh, our lives can change based on what he says on on any given day. But it's been great to catch up with you, Fanos. I'm glad you're uh, you're still doing well. And if I can uh, 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 mention a, a personal thing, it's good that uh, uh, you're you're with a girl uh, at the at the moment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, her name's Eloise. <laughs> Eloise. Yeah. Saw so you hanging out with her on the well the the weekend uh, on on, yeah. on Facebook. So I'm happy for you for that. Uh, you're still in 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 good spirits, which is which is great. Yeah, mate. I oh, look to be honest. Um, I'm always in good spirits, even when I'm yelling and screaming and you know losing my shit. Um, you know, when I'm off camera, I still maintain my positivity and you know always maintain a positive outlook. Um, you know, no matter what's going on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is, man. I've learned to live in two worlds and, you know, even though what's going on, um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, everything happens for a reason and, um, you know, my life is the way it is because that's where it was meant to go. And, um, you know, I don't question it. And as long as you have good intentions towards helping people and making a difference, it doesn't matter what the media says. It doesn't matter what the police say or whatever about you. Um, you know, the truth will come out and your efforts will not go unnoticed. Um, thank you so much for having me, Tim. Um, I'm appreciative of your level of effort and, um, you know, the towards making sure you advise people with the right information and, you know, that stuff before with the law, um, you know, I'm happy we had a bit of a bit of a back and forth there. It's part of you know what this is like, and um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in as well. And uh, people can can still view your you, you still do uh, regular uh, daily vlogs on your your Facebook page, but you also uh, do uh, more structured uh, weeknight uh, live streams now, similar to what what I do. Uh, you, you've got to show nearly uh, every every night this week. Uh, earlier this week, you're on with uh, uh, Max 
Max Egan, uh, who is, it, it's been fascinating to, to see him in the flesh so much this year because he's been uh, uh, attending all the, the freedom picnics in, in Southeast East Queensland. And I'm so used yeah. to years just seeing him like on the, uh, just on the screen and to see him like speaking at rallies and that it's, oh, it's, it, it, it's great to, to see that the, uh, him connecting. Uh, you also uh, uh, have uh, interviewed uh, Ricardo Bossi, a uh, leader of Australia One Party, who's probably the political party that's sort of most uh, aligned with the the ninety nine percent unite uh, community. I'm not saying that they all su support him, uh, uh, support his party, but certainly. Uh, you've been chatting with uh, uh, a lot of people uh, in depth, uh, like I do. So it's certainly been uh, been great. Uh, I'd recommend people to uh, to watch watch your streams and also Raf. He nearly does a show every night as well. Uh, 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 watch you guys prime time, not the, the the fake news mainstream media, but still watch. Uh, I would say Credlin six pm on Sky News. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. It's been it's been good. I just decided to um, start diversifying and start, um, you know, bringing on people. This week with all the different guests was just something that was impromptu, and um, you know, I decided to just get onto it. And I knew a few people, and I decided to just, you know, what stuff it. Let's just do one every week, every night this week, um, bar tonight because um, you know I was being interviewed by you, and you you run a great show, Tim. Good on you. Oh, thank you. Well, take care and we'll catch up again soon. Thank you very much, mate. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.